Thank you for coming over for this um, very uh, important and very interesting uh, topic of the sandwich generation, uh, women with work and double care responsibilities. And uh, as you can see, I'm going to give the two speakers, one from Japan and one from Great uh, Britain, this country. And uh, it's going to be uh, more or less comparative perhaps, uh, approach uh, today. And uh, by looking at the, the guest list today, I can see lots of uh, people uh, sitting here today came from the, the similar sort of background, uh, academic background. So I expect a very vigorous uh, discussion uh, after the talk. Um, I'm not going to go into details because uh, lots of you are already uh, experts in this field, and then those two speakers will be talking about it. Uh, but then I'd like to point out that when we talk about the issue of uh, care or the responsibility of, of uh, women, maybe not necessarily just women, but uh, of the, um, the care at, at home, uh, there might be similarities and differences between those two countries. Uh, because the, the, this issue is deeply embedded in, uh, in culture and uh, influenced by uh, social norms. Uh, I can give you lots of um, um, sort of examples from my experience, but uh, maybe I shouldn't be talking too much. So firstly, I'd like to ask Junko Yamashita uh, to, to start uh, talking. Uh, she's um, actually a living here for, for six years, uh, you said already, uh, is a lecturer at the School of Sociology, Politics and International Studies at the University of uh, Bristol uh, now. Her expertise is in comparative analysis of East Asian and European welfare regimes, especially in relation to care and gender. From 2008 to 10, she was General Secretary of the East Asian Society Policy, which is EASP, uh, research network which uh, promotes analysis and exchange of research on East Asian social policy. Her research has appeared in journals including Social Policy and Society, the Journal of International and Comparative Social Policy, and Social Science Japan Journal. She is also a co-author of Care, Cooperative Work, and Unpaid Work. Unsettled Boundary of Labor, which was published in, in Japan uh, in Japanese. I will give you a, a detailed uh, biography of uh, Giselle later, uh, just before uh, she speaks. So, can I hand it over to Junko? Good evening, <laughs> everyone. I'm very honored and pleased to be here today to present a part of my current work about the double responsibility of care. Uh, also, I'm very much looking forward to listen to general talk about the, the sandwich generation in the UK, and I think it's going to be a quite interesting com comparison we can make, the situation in Japan and the situation in the UK. And also, I would like to thank for the, the um, Shihoko, Ogawa, Shihoko Ogawa organizing this event, uh, which is a great occasion for me to hear what you think and then present uh, ongoing uh, research. So we talk about how difficult it, it is to keep work-life balance for women and or in um, uh, yeah, so the, the um, so we, we talk about how difficult it is to keep the work-life balance for women, but I'm talking about how difficult, more difficult it is to keep the, the work and the child care and elderly care. So when we talk about work-life balance, we tend to talk about child care and then work. Um, my talk, talk today is focused on the Japanese situation, including some comparison with other East Asian societies based on the international uh, collaborative project that uh, I have been leading with it. Uh, scholars based in East Asia, which was uh, which has been funded by the Japanese government. Uh, so, definition of the double responsibilities of care. Uh, it it refers to situations in which women, sometimes men, have to simultaneously provide elderly care and child care. 
and so-called namely sandwich generation in the European literature. But I name it, we named it the responsibility of care. And there are two types of sandwich, two, two types of sandwich generation. So the first, this is the, the demography in Japanese case, but the first baby boomers who are uh, born now in their 50s and 60s uh, look after their older parents on the green, so the green generations. So they are parents in blue and also grandparents. And then the second sandwich generation is their uh, second baby boomers in Japan, born in early 70s. So they are now in the early 40s and the late 30s. They care of their own elderly parents and their own, ch own children. So different type of dog responsibility of care. And my focus is on this, the second baby boomers. So the women who are in late 30s and early 40s and then providing care. That these two generations are quite different in terms of when they started to provide the care. Uh, because the, the second baby boomers providing care after the expansion of public care services in Japan. Also, there are the diff quite dramatic changes in the family structure and in behavior as well. So the, there, these are the basic figures, um, uh, but key figures to share before going into discussion about what is about double responsibility of care. The trend towards later marriage has resulted in a higher age of first childbirth and a smaller number of siblings and relative network size. And give these trends, uh, the, the demographic trends with aging society, it is expected that the, an increasing number of households will become double care burdened household that must provide elderly care and then child care at the same time but also relying to some degree on the existing long-term care and then child care services. Just to sort of um, uh, give you a basic overview of elderly care and then child care. Uh, so in Japan, both perceived have seen the rapid expansion. For example, elderly care, the introduction of the Long-Term Care Insurance Act in 2000, so relatively generous coverage, 17.46%, which I will show you in the international comparison in the next slide, uh, which is providing co comprehensive institutional and home-based services, and then also a stronger state financial commitment than other East Asian societies. So the, the rapid expansion of publicly funded elderly care. And child care, the deregulation of child care providers and mechanism of quasi market have been promoted since 1990s resulted in expansion of for-profit organizations. So the child care market expanded from 90s. The problem of care gap, care deficit, uh, day nursery and then short-term nursery has been a serious issue, especially in urban areas still. But uh, while in sort of the rural area, kindergartens do not meet children's quota. Here is the, some evidence, if I say, that the, the data shows the rapid expansion of public elderly care in Japan. Uh, it's a bit broad, isn't it? Um, so the, the triangle shows the, the, the percentage of people receiving public uh, care services. And then the, the bar showed in 2000, and the bar shows 2006. Japan is here, and the United Kingdom here. And here is Norway, Netherlands, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden. And you can see that Japan expanded quite a lot from 2000 and 2006. And I'm not sure it's a surprise for you or not, but Japan provides public long-term care much more than the United Kingdom now. So that this image of the, the Japan as a, you know, the East Asian Confucian society, heavily relying on family is rapidly changing. Another example here is the, in 2011, a population aged 65 years and over receiving long-term care. And in England, somehow, not, UK is not in this, but now the Japan is above the OECD average. So in terms of publicly funded long-term care, Japan is the same standard, could say the similar standards as uh, Scandinavian countries. And so the, this is another data I'd like to show you today, is the, how the introduction of long-term care policy changed family relationships and the women's role in the elderly care in Japan. So this data shows who is the main carer for those who required care in 1998. So if you can remember that long-term care insurance after incremented in 2000, 
This is just a couple of years before the, the care policy imp implemented. So as you can see, hopefully, <laughs> the 86% living together. And the main sort of the majority of care is a child spouse, means a daughter-in-laws. And the 86, sorry, it's so small, 86% are women. In 10 years later, the picture changed. So 2007, after the implementation of Long-Term Care Insurance Act, the living together dropped to 60%. And then that's on, also that people tend to live together when the care needed. They don't start as three-generational household. Uh, child support dropped so much, less than half, per, uh, half the, the percentage. And then majority now is a spouse living together. So the husband and the wife. And then what's interesting here is the, the professional care worker came in, 12%, as similar as the, the percent of the, the daughters in law. So there, before the long-term care ins insurance act implemented, actually there was a huge debate about Japanese people wouldn't like it. There are some conservative politicians said that's against the virtue of Japanese culture. But in reality, people love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the sort of the caring role and then the women's role is rapidly changing in just 10 years, which is quite interesting to observe. So the, this one, from now on, the, I would like to introduce some of the findings from the, the research project I just mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this project involved both questionnaire study and the interviews, semi-structured interviews. The total of 3,372 in East Asia, including Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, but the particularly heavily from Japan, we're doing now fourth wave, so it's going to be 3,000, and then interviews 90 cases, and 20 from each. And this is the, the, the sort of result, the initial result from the Japanese case. What this one is showing is the, sorry, the, because different stage of the, the questionnaire, but in total, uh, nearly 40% of people saying whether they have experienced double responsibility of care or currently doing providing both care or will, you know, will um, sort of uh, likely to provide in the next couple of years. So the, the, it was a surprise for us to see such a high percentage of women uh, saying they will be in that situation with double responsibility of care. I didn't mention, but this questionnaire uh, targeted for women who has the, the child or children under six years old. So the, the average age was 37, and the average age of first child was nine years old, but the, the, they are screened for to the women with children under six years old. And this is the employment status, so the more than 50% are engaged in paid work, so in the labor market as well. So not do only doing the child care and elderly care, but also doing uh, the work as well. And this is a result of the question asking about uh, um, which burden women feel uh, with caring both children and older people. And it shows it's really, you know, that the multiple dimension of burden and the stress these people are having not only psychological and physical, but what's interesting is about this kind of sense of can't adequately care for the parents or can't adequately or properly care for the children. So it shows these tensions between the elderly care and the child care. Interestingly, the, when we do compare inside East Asia, uh, Japan and then Korea has a higher burden, sense of burden doing both child care and elderly care. And I don't want to say this in front of Japanese government, but I think the reason behind this is that Taiwan and Hong Kong has a higher percentage of migrant domestic work. So even though they have a similar sense of obligation, they need to do both, and they are engaged in both, but they have the domestic worker at home, and they are quite sort of the, for the popular for the middle class. But Japan and Korea has a Japan particularly strict regulation for migrant workers. So that, that may be one reason. Um, but as I said, I'm not sure that the increase of the migrant domestic worker is a solution for Japan and Korea. Um, 
So I'd like to introduce you some examples, some sort of cases uh, we, of the women, which kind of situation they are from the, the interviews I had. And these are the uh, photos um, of the some women that shows that. Uh, so that she's late 30s, having three children, and then the, her mother is late 60s, and then had started dementia in the mid 60s. So she's actually doing everything on the, the, the one table, feeding baby, but helping my, her mother to eat. Uh, so I, I will just show you the case of cohabitating case and then living close case and then living with the long distance case. And this is cohabitating case. So full-time housewife and then she's only child and then she has two children, five and then three years old. The situation is mother is this uh, diabetes and almost blind and a wheelchair user. Husband is not around home much due to his occupation as firefighters. So the week schedule is filled with double care activities. And she has high burden and stress, really exhausted. Financial burden is high as well. She quitted her job as kindergarten teacher to take care of the, the mother and the children. And the previous job is kindergarten teacher, so why the, she's a dedicated to child care, but she cannot do what she wants to do for children due to mother's care. And then, so the constant stress about that. And then uh, she also struggles to go out with mother on wheelchair, and then two young children with, in the body. And then she's really struggling with her everyday life. Uh, the next case is living in the same neighborhood, 10 minutes walk, and a full-time housewife and one old sister, two children, six and then two years old. So supporting father's everyday life who had a stroke and then uh, have disability in uh, his half body and then mild dementia. She visits him every day and then helps him to go to daycare center twice a week. Mother is the main carer, but she's still working. So her mother is very upset about uh, his uh, health situation, caring situation. So the, the YB becoming almost uh, the main carer also listened to her, the mother's complaint. And YB had a good relationship with father and respect to him a lot. So also she talks about high burden and the stress, wishing if she did not have the second son her life would be better, and it could have provided more care to her father. Uh, Try to use short-term temporary nursery service, but was difficult. Feel sorry for the first son as her involvement with father's care gave him some burden and stress. Cannot talk about caring father with friends, feeling isolated, because the, the, her peers are not caring parents, I'm talking about child care, but not talking about elderly care, so she feels a bit, uh, um, can she feels not able to talk about heavy topic with her friends and wanted to disappear when her first son was reluctant to go to school and it required her intensive support but had to keep taking care of her father so she couldn't give her support to her son as much as she wanted. Another example is in K, uh, in the, this is the countryside. The first two example are from the, the, the Yokohama, so the the sort of mega city, and then this is the from the countryside in Japan. So living apart, two hours drive, three part-time employment, and then has a one uh, older brother and three children of nine, six, and three years old. So father had a stroke and then physical disability and lost speech. He was recommended to be in the nursing home, but uh, he, uh, the, she respects father's preference to live at home. When he came back home from hospital, she visited him twice a week but now refrains herself from visiting him as she managed to organize daily care service through this public care services and also cannot bear its financial cost. So she wants to visit him more, but cannot afford it because the, she's juggling three part-time job and the, her husband not earning so much. So she juggles three part-time job to support family, worried about what happens when the, her father needs more care. So financial constraint there. So in the, in the sort of sum up, so these are the, the examples and the key factors for understanding the responsibility of care situation. So how women feel burden about it, depending on the age and the health of the parents and parents-in-law. Interestingly, in Japan, because of the public long-term care services, if the, 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 the care needs level is higher, uh, 
I'm talking about the parents, then maybe they don't have so much stress because they tend to be in the institution, not at home. So the, 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 the health situation, if the, the, the needs of the care situation increase, the stress goes down. Relationship with parents and the parents in law is also a very interesting aspect. If the, the, the son situation has a better relationship with parents and parents in law, they have more stress because they want to give more. So that, that is the, in the relationship with husband matters and the household finance condition matters, which kind of the, the care services they use matters and also living condi condition and the employment matters. But the interesting thing is, it's not about how much intensive care you give, but also the, the, it's, a, it's, not a, it's about uh, the social norm of performing, provi uh, providing care for the parents and the children. So move on to the characteristics of double responsibility of care in Japan. So the, the, it's the, what's difficult about it is need to simultaneously respond different types of needs from children and then frail elder. And if forced to make priority between child care and elderly care constantly. And it depends on, you know, that it's the priority is not only, it's not the free choice. It's influenced by social norms on care, who should provide care to who and then how the help the husband or relative networks, friends, local communities, how uh, about the finance, and then also the availability and accessibility of care services uh, matters to make that, to force women to make a priority. For example, like I said, women want to provide a care for the parents, but they cannot do so because there is no space in nursery that they get more stress. Or they want to take care of children more, but they, 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 the relatives pressures the women to take care of all the parents, then there is, will be a stress. And also the introduction of this public care, long-term care insurance act has created the care activities which generate new types of caring responsibility in Japan, so which is care management. So that increasingly people don't need to live together, but managing care services and then the care from the distance. And then also that's uh, giving the more women, 30s, 40s, involved in the double responsibility of care. So, um, so double responsibility of care creates multiple issues from providing both elderly care and then child care. So one plus one is not equal to two. It seems like one plus one equals more than two. And then we need to consider child care and elderly care as a unit in the social policy research and then practice. The problem is that I didn't talk so much. This is more policy uh, sort of in, uh, operation and then practice. But in Japan, it's both expanded, but it's a different sort of department. So the people using the care about child care, but nobody knows who is using both. So the, the coordination is not there. And we need to uh, social service to deal with child care and elderly care together. For example, you know, the flexible or short time child care or home health services, which you can get if you are caring for elderly people, but not for children. But it would be so helpful to have a home health service to look at family as a whole, not only elderly, but all whole family. And we need to more looking at the intergenerational relations and the family support, which used to be considered as Japan's cultural uh, asset but it's not anymore. So the, the Japanese social policy need to look at uh, the, the supporting family. So this is my last question. Is that responsibility of care a particular issue for Japan or not? And I think if I'm talking about the particular this type of 30s and 40s who take care of children, own children and elderly parents. And I, the, maybe the, the answer is no. It is or will be a social issue in the UK because aging population later age at the first birth, even later in the UK at the, the first birth, the birth. So the women in the 30s, 40s doing both. And also the increasing emphasis on the British social policy, English particularly, focus on supporting informal carers. So there is a shift towards the UK might also this become a serious issue. But also I would say, yes, this is a particular Japanese situation. 
because in Europe there is a research already done that child care is always prioritized over the elderly care. So the people don't have this tension and the negotiation which should prioritize in a macro sort of trend. I'm sure that the individual cases are different, but this tension comes from social norms. You need to provide the care to all the parents and also take care of children is much stronger. But I'm not sure this is gonna be for the next generation in Japan too, it's also changing. So maybe only I'm talking about the current situation, but might not stay. So this is the, the my talk. And then, oh, I have to, um, I want to just introduce you about this uh, WPR Support Yukon project, which is the, well, some of the um, people we interviewed, from people who I, we interviewed, uh, started the project about the, the making handbook about double responsibility of care and then distribute it to the professional care workers and the local communities who are worried about facing double responsibility of care or who can be supporting these women who are being isolated in the community. And then this is, it's quite interesting now, the Japanese sort of local social policy, doing like sort of crowdfunding, asking the local people to donate to this project, to you know, contribute to the local. And then we are doing this uh, WK Yokohama project. And I, will, I have a flyer. And then actually, that, so the, I know you are not the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, students, but if you are interested and then so on, please support this project. <laughs> and then I think they will accept credit cards. So you can <laughs> even donate <laughs> from here in the UK. But it, it is good to see this kind of grassroots activities happening after the research project. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, jun I, I think Yokohama is one of the most advanced um, area uh, in uh, sort of, especially the child welfare system. I think the, the mayor of Yokohama managed to uh, uh, reduce the number of the children who are still waiting to be uh, in the child care, uh, the public child care system. Whereas in, in Tokyo, it's still, uh, it's still a poor condition. Uh, my niece keeps complaining about um, she wants to work, but uh, she, she can't sort of uh, have her children uh, looked after by a public child care system. So Yokohama is one of the most of but thanks to people like Junko San, who like that so much work. But uh, next uh, speaker, I'd like to go on to uh, Giselle Corey. Uh, Giselle is a, a senior uh, research fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research, uh, which is a UK-based uh, progressive think tank. Uh, actually, that's where I, I found her uh, out. Uh, they issued a uh, public um, um, document, and uh, I thought, well, uh, they are the right uh, people to, to talk about this uh, uh, topic. Uh, and, and she specializes in policy uh, relating to, to child care, skills, and the labor make, uh, market with a focus on uh, gender analysis. Uh, prior to this, she worked on uh, the issues uh, at the Resolution Foundation. Uh, is it a UK foundation? Resolution Foundation? Mm -hmm. No, a uh, think tank. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, a think tank focusing on law to middle income households in, in, in the UK. Uh, prior to joining the Resolution Foundation, she was at the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, uh, which is uh, the Treasury, uh, HM Treasury and the Prime Minister's uh, strategy uh, unit, which is Cabinet Office. So I'll hand over to you. Would you like to come? Uh, hello. Um, I have, that was really good, thank you. I have so much to say just on the kind of interesting uh, um, kind of comparative analysis between um, the UK and Japan, but I will hold off um, for now. I hope we'll get to that a bit in the Q&A. Um, and I will talk um, mostly about the UK in my presentation. Um, as, as said, I, so I, I work at IPPR, Institute for Policy Research. Um, we do uh, we work across the policy areas. I work um, social policy and labour market analysis. Um, a few years back, so in summer of 2013, we, we produced this, oh, the Sandwich Generation, uh, which is about um, this, this very topic. And so I'm going to draw a bit from that analysis. 
um, and um, try and bring up the speed a bit, um, given that um, politically we're, we're in a, um, a bit of a different situation now, um, and, um, and also talk um, a bit about the policy ideas we have, the, the things we think will, um, uh, will help um, mediate and, and kind of correct the imbalances we have at the moment. Um, so, so why why talk about sound generation now? Um, surely, if it's been around now, it's been around always. Um, well, no, there are kind of some key trends um, at play, um, making this um, a um, more of a pressing issue now than it's been in the past. And um, you've touched upon some of them. So the um, aging population, um, women having children um, at uh, a later stage, um, women in work more so there's there's been a trend for um uh greater employment at older ages and that's <coughs> mostly been driven by women um partly because people want to and um, partly because people need to the state pension age is rising will continue to rise i would imagine um for the foreseeable future um and um and so it becomes a bit more of a necessity uh, which i think i am a bit ahead of myself yeah and um, so some of the things i've been saying um, and, um, and, and one of the other big changes we've seen is that um, women also are, are taking a kind of their place in the labour market in a different way. So not only are employment rates rising, but we see um, uh, for younger, younger people at least, the gender gap in pay shrinking, um, women, women's numbers creeping up in the professions, in political representation, for example. So see women taking a different place in the labour market as well as simply working more. Um, and then there's, there's a few other trends. So um, women are the nation's carers. Um, they have always been, they continue to be. Um, there's slight um, uh, equalising now. We see um, more um, stay-at-home dads, for example. Um, but, um, but it's still incredibly um, imbalanced. Um, and older women are, are largely invisible. So if you look at, um, you know, turn on the TV and look at the, you know, count in a day the amount of, of men uh, that you see who um, are um, older and you can take even an incredibly low threshold, you know, put a kind of, say, 40 and above, um, which I know I'm not saying 40 and above when you're old, but um, if you even take a very low threshold that and compare the amount of men you see on TV versus the amount of women, um, it's incredibly unequal. Um, women are less than a third of our representation in Parliament, and um, they are um, about a twentieth of our representation in 5,500 um, uh, senior positions. They um, still lag behind on things like boards, um, in the judiciary, um, in uh, STEM subjects, um, in uh, journalism. I mean, it's, it's 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 quite incredible actually um, at senior levels um, and in public life, and they just don't seem to be there. Um, but this um, th this uh, kind of dual hit of being a woman, of being an older woman, is not something we tend to talk about in policy. So there's, there's um, you know, for women, there are a kind of cluster of policies which are um, are targeting, um, for example, mothers, childcare provision, targeting mothers um, who um, <coughs> obviously uh, are mothers of young children are to not to be older women. So that's kind of focused on a younger um, part of the population. Um, and then we have um, uh, policies which are targeting older people. So we have, um, uh, in theory, um, uh, better, in theory, some provision for social care. I'll talk a bit more about that later because it's, it's quite measly. Um, we have um, a triple lock pension, um, which um, will support um, older people as a group and um, make sure that their earnings don't fall in price prices, for example, in the UK. But actually, if you take both both women and, and so the two characteristics, being older and being a woman, that intersectionality of those two things um, isn't really taken um, into account in public policy. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a gap, I think, for, as far as government's concerned. Um, I think that has to change because uh, we've got a growing sandwich generation and also because um, we have... Um, we have a few macroeconomic problems in the UK, um, not least of which are productivity puzzle, um, uh, whereby productivity isn't going up anymore. So we're not becoming better in effect at doing the things we do. Um, and this is um, a very new trend for the UK. Um, uh, came about 
a little bit pre-recession um, and uh, and hasn't and our productivity just hasn't come back. So you look at things like that and you say, actually, we need to make sure that if we have people that have skills, they are in work um, and they are using those skills as best they can. Um, and also, as I say, increase state pension agents as a kind of a household issue for people getting their fam uh, finances together. Um, if you, I'm not going to dwell too much on the um, data because. Um, uh, I think we've had quite a bit of data so far, but I'm, I'm going to um, touch a little bit on the salary generation for the work we did. Um, so, uh, older women wanted to become sandwich carers um, than men. Um, the peak uh, sandwich carrying age, 40 to 54, um, and um, in the UK, 28% of grandparents with grandchildren under the age of 16 still have a parent um, alive, and 36% of grandmothers who are part of this particular sandwich generation are working, while 18% are retired. That just kind of gives you just a, a kind of idea of, a broad idea of this group. Um, and uh, and we've, we've talked about some of those factors um, underneath which kind of contribute to this trend. Um, just a few um, details about these people. Who are they, these um, double carers? Um, so they tend to be younger. Um, so if you um, look at the, the um, profile of grandmothers who care for their grandchildren, um, younger uh, grandmothers, um, i.e. those under 50, are more likely to provide childcare, um, which is what this chart shows. Um, <coughs> partly because younger grandmothers are more likely to have younger grandchildren. Um, and I think there's also socioeconomic effects there. So you see um, lower income uh, mothers tend to be um, mothers at younger ages. Um, then middle or higher income mothers, um, and and that's kind of that's carried through the generations. Um, and those lower income mothers are more likely to um, need um, informal childcare support um, at some point. So I think we've got we've kind of got a mixture of factors there. Um, but um, despite the fact that younger grandparents are more likely to provide care and um, childcare, the um, there's a greater number of older grandparents. Um, so therefore, on, yeah, if you take the, the group as a whole, child, there's more childcare being given by those older grandparents um, because there are more of them. Um, and, um, and and also we can look at we can look at the employment status of um, these uh, grandparents as well. So um, this shows that um, in a similar vein to parents, grandmothers um, who care. Um, uh, find themselves juggling childcare responsibilities and work. So it's not the case that we've got a bunch of mums, they've got kids, they're juggling the idea of childcare and work, and then all their parents are just kind of uh, hanging about, twiddling their thumbs, yeah. saying, oh, I'll look after the grandkids every day because I've got nothing else to do. We're, we're looking at um, a group that um, of grandparents that are juggling work and childcare um, very actively. Um, because, it, it, again, because most grandparents uh, or the majority of grandparents are retired it means that actually that, that graph on the right shows that actually of grandparents who provide childcare the the highest group are the biggest group are the retired group um, uh, but of if but if you look by employment status um, you're more likely to be uh, providing childcare um, in those full time and part time um, uh, employment um, statuses or non-retired employment statuses than you are if you're retired. It's kind of looking at it, looking two ways at the same question. Um, looking now um, onto the income spectrum. So uh, another way to cut this group is to look at how much they earn. Um, so blue to green um, is increases increase in earnings, and along the bottom you've got how much um, childcare they provide. Um, and that is um, that. I mean, that what that tells us is, firstly, you're more likely to provide childcare full stop if you're a lower income uh, grandparent, um, but also that um, you're more likely to provide um, uh, more childcare to a degree. So you've got you've got this. Um, if you ignore kind of the, the leftmost and rightmost uh, in the middle, you've got kind of a higher likelihood of, of the five to nine hours than either um, more or less either side. Um, and then the higher your income, the less likely you are to be doing that job. Um, and I think there's a lot of kind of factors at play here. I think um, 
you know, there's a lot of different reasons people choose a grandparent um, over, uh, for example, formal childcare services. Um, I'd say kind of the three biggest factors um, are flexibility. Um, so does my lo local nursery provide childcare for an evening shift, for example, because I'm a shift worker and that's when I'm at work? Um, no, probably don't. We're really, really bad at flexible childcare in the UK. Uh, does my mum? Yes, yeah, she probably would if I asked her. Um, trust? We have a, a, a generally a cultural acceptance uh, of formal childcare, um, but that varies heavily um, between um, ethnic groups in the UK. It varies heavily between within income across income groups, um, and also um, in in kind of local pockets. So you could have just an area where it's none of the other mums trust formal childcare. You don't really like formal childcare. You kind of all influence each other's views, and actually you're more likely to use informal stuff. So. Um, Whereas trust of informal childcare, you might or you might not, you're probably very, you're much more likely to trust your, your own mother to look after your children. Um, and um, thirdly, but probably most importantly, is the cost factor. Um, childcare is really expensive in the UK. Um, it's, uh, it's gone up, I think, for, un, for, for the youngest, I think for under two, the nursery went up by a third over the course of the last apartment. Um, I, can you imagine anything else you buy going up by a third over five years? It's incredible. Um, it's... Um, uh, parents tend to pay more than a lot of other countries, particularly a lot of other European countries, um, and um, they uh, tend to pay. Um, they, it tends to vary a lot wherever you are. So there's no kind of there's no national standard. In London, it's about um, I think it's 28 percent higher um, for nursery on average in London um, than the UK average. Um, uh, wages aren't. Um, for particularly for low-income groups, they are not 28% higher than if they were a low-income group somewhere else in the country. So there's um, a massive cost barrier there. And in fact, I did some not looking at grandparents, looking at their um, uh, mothers. Um, I did some research which found that of um, all mums who want to work or want to work more than they're currently working, the cost of childcare is the single biggest barrier. Um, I think anyone who has come into contact with a nursery lately will not find that at all surprising. Um, but um, but we still see a lack of um, of kind of government support to bring that cost down. There's some. Um, I was going to work a bit later. I'll talk about it now just to break up the day to talk a bit about policy. Um, we do have a uh, good childcare policy um, in the UK, um, ish. So we have um, a free offer for three and four year olds, and also for some to the most disadvantaged two year olds, they get 15 hours free um, childcare a week in ten time, um, and um, that's excellent. Um, but it's also incredibly underfunded. So actually, providers get a bunch of cash if they take on, you know, they'll, they'll take on X amount of uh, three or four-year-olds, and they will get, say, four quid an hour um, for each of those for each hour that they, that child's in their care. Um, it costs more than that to provide the, the childcare. So most nurseries are saying, actually, government, you're giving us much money to do this, but that's not enough money. So what we have to do is every parent who wants more than 15 hours, which is quite a considerable chunk, and most working parents, um, they have to pay, they, we basically have to hike up their, their, their costs because we need to cover this underfunded um, subsidy. Um, so, uh, yeah, what you see is actually, it, it makes, it means that kids are, uh, get that 15 hours, which is, which can be very good developmentally, it can be very good for parents to get that break, but actually if you want to work more, uh, to work at all, you're going to have to top out that 15 hours with inflated childcare costs. So actually, it's kind of giving with one hand and taking with the other. Uh, we also have um, uh, so within our tax credit system, which is um, our, our kind of income top, top up system um, for um, working families, we have childcare subsidy in that, that as well. So um, that just that says if you've got um, X amount of out of pocket costs, we will cover um, a chunk of it um, to mean that actually you, it, it's financially viable for you to go out and work. Um, so the costs are kept down a bit, um, they're not capped, you might still pay a massive amount for your childcare, um, it might still cost you more to put your child in childcare than it does for you to go out and work, particularly if you're a low income parent. Um, child, and, and, you know, we can, I, I don't want to go into here a big detailed discussion about why well, child, childcare is expensive, there are a lot of um, uh, reasons and that's a, that's a very big discussion on its, on its own, but um, I will say just one thing it is uh, people powered. Um, you need quite a few um, staff to look after children. Um, we have quite tight ratios on how many staff can look after one child. So if you think about it, if you're 
you're paying staff to look after your child and you're only getting, say, the minimum wage or close to the minimum wage, um, then those sums um, are going to be difficult unless government steps in. Uh, we do know, by the way, that there's a massive economic return if government does step in. So you kind of might be thinking, well, childcare, if people can't afford to go out to work, then they're not economically like viable workers. Just go home, stay at home, doesn't matter. Just wait till the kids get a bit older. Um, but actually, if we bring mothers into the workforce, um, or fathers, um, but it is mostly mothers we're talking about when we talk about the impact of cost of childcare. Um, it, has a, it has a big economic return. We did some modelling which showed if you increase the maternal employment rate by five percentage points, um, which sounds like a lot, it's, it's, it's ambitious, but it's in, incredibly um, uh, viable, it's, um, an achievable goal. And then you bring in 750 million uh, pounds annually in increased taxes and decreased benefit expenditure. Um, so it's, in, it's an incredible investment and it, it makes economic sense. Um, which is uh, probably part of the reason why um, our new elected government is going to increase the childcare offer. So that 15 hours of free childcare I talked about, they're doubling it, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, three and four year olds will now get, well sorry, as of 2017 will get 30 hours of free childcare a week. Uh, loads of delivery problems, again I won't go into it, but um, I will be uh, uh, definitely nagging government about it quite a lot over the coming years. Um, but um, but that's but it's it's an incredible um, kind of step forward and an acknowledgement that childcare is um, important for mums but for our nation as well. Um, that was a bit of a tangent. Um, I'm going to go back to um, my slides now. Um, okay. Um, consequences of an emerging care gap. So all the facts we talked about. Um, people. Um, Having kids later, childcare being expensive, uh, people working longer in, into um, into older age, um, they are um, they are in effect coming together to create a bit of a perfect storm. Um, what you find is that um, uh, it is women um, who tend to be taking up the slack um, and um, and tend to be caring for both their children but then their grandchildren when they um, become. Um, when they get to that, that position, they're more likely to leave work or reduce their working hours. Um, actually, this is quite stark. So, of um, unemployed unemployed people who left their last job to care for someone, um, that was the case for 17% of um, unemployed women. So they said, like, nearly a fifth said, we're going to stop working for someone and care for someone. 1% of men um, said the same thing. So I think, and that, and, and that is. Um, uh, of older women, so we're seeing a m massive transition to from work to care for women that we're not seeing for men. Um, there is so my second point here. So there's quality of life considerations. I, um, you know, there's a risk when we stand up here and we talk about our data that we actually with you know desensitising what's very very personal, very important choices. Um, and um, it's absolutely not up to me to to dictate whether someone should work or care, uh, it's, it, it should be their choice, but the, the kind of the point of this discussion is that should be a real choice, um, and um, uh, and people shouldn't feel forced into um, one um, at the um, loss of the other when, when they don't want to um, do that. Um, and th and there is the, the quality of life impact, so generally caring for um, uh, elder care decreases quality of life, and child care increases quality of life. Um, and um, you know, read into that what you may. It just it's it's a consideration, um, you know, in a in a context where we should be taking into account well-being and not just economic factors. Um, it's um, it's kind of something we should have in mind. Um, I'm not going to talk about this last point. Um, I a few stats for the number uh, for, the, for the stats lovers amongst you. This is. Um, this is just showing that um, there's some very good stories. So employment in increases um, uh, for um, those aged between 50 and um, the state pension age um, have been massive. Uh, so gone from below 60% in 1993 to above 70 in 2011. Um, that's very good. Um, the data generally suggests that's because people want to. Um, though there are a group that are doing that because they need to um, financially. Um, that second point, older women, um, the older you get, the less likely you are to work. Um, uh, unemployment, comparatively low for women in comparison to men, uh, but long-term unemployment is a really big problem. And, and so that's saying that 40% um, of, uh, of women who um, are employed are long-term unemployed um, of the over 50s. 
uh, a long-term unemployment is to be out of the labour market for a year. Actually, that it's going to be much higher than that because what you see with um, older, but, uh, older men and older women um, is um, they fall out of these statistics because you look for their work for a while, everyone ignores you because they're not interested. There's rife ageism, and um, and it may be that your skills aren't suited to a changed labour market. Um, you might have got qualifications that were relevant 30 years ago and aren't anymore, um, or jobs just might be hard to find. Um, but you stop looking, so you fall off this unemployment, the unemployment statistics, you become economically inactive. Um, so actually, it's, it's likely that number is much, much higher and it's quite dire for, for um, older people who lose their um, jobs and uh, can't find more coffee. Um, average retirement age, uh, just a comment on what we've been already saying, the, the um, retirement age is increasing, it will continue to increase, um, it's, um, and that's the case for both. Um, Um, of traditionally their um, pension age has been lower. Um, so um, I'm going to move on a bit to um, policy now. Um, before I do, I'll just a nod to the recession um, because it's um, crazy to um, ignore what's been the biggest economic event of, um, of modern times. Um, this was um, an odd story actually for older people. Um, you saw both employment and unemployment go up. Um, that's probably because it's um, recession and everyone's run out of money, so people don't want um, to. You see uh, less people retiring or becoming economically inactive um, in older age, um, and more people just keeping on um, earning. Um, but these are the trends for unemployment, trends for long-term unemployment. So, I mean, jobs. This is just a kind of. Uh, I think a, a symptom of there being less jobs around it is harder to um, then get one, particularly if you're um, an older person in the labour market. Um, so uh, I'm now going to talk a bit about. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think I'm I'm, push, I'm pushing on for time, so I have to go um, over this a bit quickly. Um, just to, to breeze over here. Um, the, yeah, oh, we went in some ways. Um, all of this has led to some very, very bad symptoms, um, like a big gender pay gap. Um, if you have more women leaving um, the labour market, both when they have children and then when they're their grandparents, um, to look after their grandchildren, uh, you can't earn as much if you're not um, progressing. Um, and we see uh, IPPR, for example, have, and others have done work on the impact of taking time out, and it tends to be that if you know, if, if someone's staying in work and their trajectory goes like this and you, you leave here, you can't just come back to this point and keep going like that. It tends to be that you have a poor income trajectory the longer you take a break from the labour market, particularly if you're not very high skilled. Um, so, and that, that, will, that builds up over time and has a double impact if you're taking care, out, uh, care breaks twice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, because I'm running out of time. I'm gonna go straight on to uh, policy ideas. Um, uh, as that is what uh, mainly what um, I do, um, and uh, you know we've heard a lot about the challenges, um, and um, and they are quite big. Um, but what can we do about it? Um, so supporting um, well, first of all the categories, um, we can make sure that um, work and uh, older people in work um, are are kind of a better. Um, are better supported um, in in making sure that firstly um, they can they can work they can progress and work but secondly that they can balance um, both care and work. Um, we you know, as we've been saying, the childcare policy um, is there to play that part that that role for younger people. We don't have something to play that role for older people. Um, and the um, the second area is making sure that there is. Um, Kind of greater balance in um, in care, a kind of across the generation. So actually, that we're not in a position where we say there is, you know, that there is so little childcare to go around, but it is so expensive you can't afford it, and therefore you're going to have to turn to informal informal care. So, so on the first one, on uh, supporting um, older people in work, particularly older women. Um, some interesting ideas here. So I'm going to. I don't. I'm, unfortunately, my, my first um, example is uh, and my second example European. Uh, but I think I do have some uh, one interesting example from Japan later on. Uh, but to start from these ones, so we've got um, 
Family Caring Time, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the German because it won't work very well. Uh, family Caring Time is a great, um, a great German policy um, where employees can reduce working time um, and earnings for a fixed period and then return uh, full time. So um, that, would, that would mean, for example, I said, right, I'm going to go half time for a year um, because um, I've got uh, grandchildren growing up or because I've got um, a parent um, who I need to care for. Um, my earnings aren't going to drop by 50%. Though. My earnings are only going to uh, be three quarters of what they were. Um, and then the next year, when I'm back, after that year I've taken off, my earnings are still only three quarters of what they were. So um, it, it's, it's smoothing your earnings. I mean, you don't have to take that hit while you're away. Um, you, can, you spread out between when you're away and when you come back. Um, uh, another system um, in Belgium, employees are eligible to reduce their working hours. Um, uh, if they've been in employment for a long time, so not in employment in the one place, but in, in work. Um, and, um, and basically the state takes some of the um, financial hit. Um, and um, and that's, that's yeah, it's allowing people to balance working care um, so that they don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Um, this next point, transferable parental leave. So when, this is the idea of extending parental leave as we know it, which is um, only for parents of a child, to grandparents. Um, and actually it's a, um, I, I think it's a really interesting idea. If you have, um, for example, a family where um, uh, you have a, um, a couple and you want to take, you want to take some time off, um, but you, you, you've got working, you don't want to take too much time off because you don't want to have a mother mother pay penalty, um, or you know that it's in your career it would be difficult, whatever your personal circumstances are, then you can transfer some of that leave to a grandparent. Um, and that is, in effect, it's, it's making it more financially viable um, for grandparents to be involved in care. So it's not, it's not going to um, uh, help your, the, the, the grandparent if they can't take the time off work themselves. Um, but it does make it, it legitimises it. So it says, actually, I'm not just disappearing from work to, I'm not just trying to rush out at four every day, actually. I'm going to take this time off. It's sanctioned by government. You legally, you have to let me take these three months off and come back again. Um, uh, Labour suggested something um, along these lines in a manifesto. Um, uh, the other parties are yet to take it up. Um, and um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure I'd expect anyone to... Um, soon, um, uh, just because it will uh, incur a cost to do to <coughs> um, But um, perhaps in the longer term, we might see something like that happening. Um, mentoring, jobs guarantee. So um, this is the, the, um, universal in terms of the, the age um, of which you um, apply them. But they, they would be things that would help um, older people in as much as they would help um, anyone um, in the labor market. Um, Time banking. Um, so one of the ideas, one of the, the problems you talked about was that um, people don't always live close to the people they want to care for. Um, so one um, idea this, that so this example I think is a social enterprise uh, in the Isle of Wight um, is that uh, I want to care for I want to care for my dad. My dad lives four hours away. Uh, a bunch of other people live four hours away as well in that same city or town. Um, who may also be in a similar position. So actually, if I spend my Wednesday evening caring for someone who needs care nearby, um, and I, I do it for two hours, then I, I have a two-hour credit um, on this time banking system, um, and then someone up where my dad lives spends that their two-hour credit, looking, or earns their two-hour credit working, uh, or if not working, caring uh, for my dad. So it's kind of you swapping family members. So it's a bit weird, but um, it it means that um, uh, you, you're kind of meeting demand locally um, for something that, to be honest, loads of people need um, to do. Um, so you know, why don't we all get together and be more a bit more collective about it? Um, so the oh, actually, the, the, this is the one where I have um, a Japanese example. Actually, um, I'm probably going to say this horribly, but I, I think it's Korea Kipu. Um, which is um, this same idea, this time bank idea, um, uh, and it's in uh, so the, the Japanese and other white um, examples of the um, And then um, grandparents um, and care, so the Grandparents Association's hub status. Um, 
So this one, um, I've forgotten the details of this one. Um, oh, okay, this is it. So at the moment, one of the, the other ways we uh, support childcare, um, other than the, the cash transfers or the um, subsidies I talked about, is the Short Start Children's Centres. I don't know if anyone's ever maybe seen the sign or past Short Start Children's Centre or used one. Um, the idea is that it's a hub of services. So not only are you providing people with childcare, but you're also um, you have um, services for uh, mums in need of particular types of emotional, physical support. Um, perhaps you have um, uh, nutritional and health services for kids as well. Uh, you might stick in the library there, maybe put the rec centre next door. Like the idea is if you're going somewhere, let it meet all your needs in the same place. You're more likely to have those needs, needs met because you don't have to go anywhere else. Um, and, um, and also it, it, you're creating community, you're creating an institution. Um, so the idea behind this um, is that um, uh, put, put grandparent programmes in with these children's centres. Uh, and it's wonderful because it's the meeting of the generations, um, which we do very much too little of in the UK. Um, and, um, uh, and it means that you're providing, um, you're, you're, you're kind of putting care under the same banner. So you can, um, you can go to a child, uh, the short start centre, and have um, an, an elder person cared for and, and your child cared for there. And it's, um, it's kind of all under one roof. Um, so that is that is me. I'm sorry I took um, longer than I um, uh, thought I would, but um, I think this is an excellent discussion. Um, there's loads more information on IPPL's website if you would like to look up the sound generation. Um, and we're always doing more work and um, and always really keen to have more conversations um, about these policy issues. Um, and I look forward to the Thank you.